Good morning, everyone. Welcome to TMC for Seniors. And this month we are talking about pain and how to manage our pain. And today I have Jill Jones, who is a longtime TMC for Seniors volunteer. She does many of our presentations for us. Um, she does a lot of research on, on topics that we provide to her. And this is one uh, that she's going to be discussing today, using your mind to manage pain. Welcome, Jill. Hi, Maya. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Yeah, so why don't I'll go ahead and let you get started, Jill. Okay, well, thank you all for coming today. Um, my number one objective with this presentation is to show you some really simple, easy to use mindfulness tools that you can do every day, even if it's only for a few minutes, that really have proven to help dial down the intensity of pain, especially chronic pain. But first I'm gonna talk about an overview of how pain works in your body. And uh, then I'll show you some of these tools and then I'll show you the research at the end. So let's start out with the nervous system. The nervous system is our body's communication system. It uh, its job is to sense and respond to changes that are happening both inside and outside of our body. And this, the nervous system is made, uh, made up of two parts. The central nervous system, which is the brain and the spinal cord there in yellow, and the peripheral nervous system. And those are nerve fibers that branch off of the spinal cord and extend to all parts of our body and our internal organs. And they, the central nervous system communicates with the peripheral nervous system by strings of neurons. And neurons are these special nerve cells that are able to send signals to each other so that our body can communicate. Most of uh, of other neurons, about 99% of them have this sort of structure. They have a cell body with the DNA in the middle of the cell there. And then you see those branches coming off of the cell body. They're part of the cell body, but they're the listeners. They listen for messages coming in from other nerve cells. So there can be thousands of these dendrites listening for messages that it's going to pick up from other nerve cells. And if the message is important enough, then it will turn that message into an electrical signal that travels down this other extension called an axon. And at the end of the axon, it will release a chemical. Well, once it finds the other neuron it wants to talk to, it gets really close to it, releases a chemical like a neurotransmitter and creates a chemical reaction right where they almost touch. And that's at the point you've probably heard the term synapse. That chemical reaction is at the synapse. So the next neuron will pick up that message. And if it's important, it turns it into an electrical impulse, travels down the axon, finds another neuron, and then communicates that message to the next neuron. That's how they, they work. And like I said, 99% of these neurons in our nervous system have this structure. And we have about 100 billion of them throughout our nervous system, 85 billion in the brain alone. But there are exceptions. And this exception is called the sensory neuron. It's a particular type of neuron. And what its job is, is it will uh, translate or um, it, it'll pick up sensations and turn them into an electrical impulse. So it'll, it, they are out close to our sense organs like our skin and our tongue and our nose and everything. So they pick up, these uh, sensations, like pain as well, they'll, they'll pick up a sensation, convert it into an electrical impulse, and then send it through a nerve fiber up to the spinal cord and then up to the brain. 
but it has a little bit of a different configuration. The cell body is in the sort of in the middle of the uh, cell. And instead of just one axon, it has a, an axon with two branches. And you'll see there those dendrites, the listeners, they are they are very close to the area to the to our sense organs to pick up the sensation. And at the end of those dendrites, they have these little receptors that pick up the pain, for instance, or touch or smell. So they have receptors that pick up the sensation. Now, why am I telling you all of that? Well, it's, how, it's part of the story of how pain is felt. Let's say you're uh, running along or walking along and all of a sudden you feel this pain in your knee. Well, what happened was that sensory neuron picked up that sensation and sent a quick signal up your nervous system to your brain. So it picked up that sensation, converted into an electrical signal through the chain of other neurons, it sent the signal over to the spinal cord and then up to the brain. And then once it gets to the brain, it goes up the signal, this pain signal is going up through the brain stem up to the thalamus, which like thalamus is like a sorting center in your brain. It gets the signal in and decides where should it go. So one of the signals that goes up to the sensory area of the brain that's an area where, where pain is felt. This is where you first feel the physical sensation of pain. It also identifies where the pain is coming from, it's coming from the knee. And these other signals then, uh, some of the signals go over to the prefrontal cortex over there, the front part of the brain, and also to the amygdala, which is the emotional center of the brain, and that's where when it goes to those areas, that's when the intensity level is either dialed up or down, down, dialed up or dialed down. They call that our experience of pain. So we have the physical sensation at the top of the brain, but how our pain experience depends on what's happening over at that, um, our, the thinking part of our brain and our emotional center. Now, while all this is going on, the pain signals going up to these different areas, our brain is creating a reaction to that pain. So these signals going up are called ascending pain signals, but there are a reaction which are descending pain signals. So it happens there. Once you've identified the pain is coming from the knee, you might get a jerk or reaction, the knee kind of jerks away because there was the signal sent down from the movement area of the brain, the motor cortex, that's for movement, that sends the signal down through the thalamus and back down to your muscle to quickly move your knee away from the painful object. Also, um, there's pain relief coming because in the brainstem, you, you may have heard of endorphins. That's our body's natural pain relief chemicals. Those get released because when we first feel that pain, it could be really intense and then it kind of backs off a little bit. So let's say you hit your thumb with a hammer. That first bang <laughs> feels hurts really bad, but then it kind of backs off a little bit and will turn into a throb. Well, when that pain backs off, that's because the endorphins got down, down there to rescue you. Another reaction, which is happening, all of this is happening really fast, is stress. So behind that thalamus is a hypothalamus. And when the signal gets there and gets to the amygdala, your sympathetic nervous kicks in. That's your stress system, your fight or flight system. So you get really stressed about this. So all that's going on, you may be stressed, you may be hurting. A next out normal thing we would do is grab our knee and say, think of, 
you're starting to think more now about what's happening and you start rubbing on your knee. When you rub your knee, it actually intercepts those pain signals and you don't feel the pain, you feel that rubbing, that's called light touch. Light touch overtakes the pain signal. You don't, you can't, the nerve can't carry two signals at the same time. So it, your light touch signal has a priority. So that's true of other things you might do like um, apply heat or apply cold that gives you, that takes away that pain signal temporarily. So let's go over the definition of pain, the formal definition. And um, this is, uh, I can't read it at the bottom there, but pain is an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential pain of tissue damage. So it's a sensory and an emotional experience. And then acute pain is a type of pain that typically lasts three to six months and then it heals. It goes through a healing process. But if it doesn't heal or it lasts longer, then it turns into chronic pain. And that can be a year, six months, it can be ongoing. So the difference between acute and chronic pain is really a time frame. Um, and what we're going to be dealing with here in the, in the rest of this discussion is more about chronic pain because that's what we're dealing with as we get, get older. Seniors, a lot of us have chronic pain, things like arthritis that are ongoing, or you might have nerve pain because our nervous system changes as we get older. And the more pain we have, those little sensory neurons, they get more sensitive. They can even grow more pain receptors. So we feel pain more as we grow older. Um, and we can describe it in different ways, aching, throbbing. Everybody's threshold of pain and tolerance for pain is different. And so that the way they test for people's threshold, you can have a group of people and put your hand in a bucket of water and sit or bucket of ice water. And if you hold your hand in ice water, at first it may not feel too bad, but as you hold it there, then at some point you feel pain and you want to pull it out. That's your threshold. And people will be pulling their fists out of the ice bucket at different times. Tolerance is how long can you hold, hold it in that ice bucket when you're in pain? And different people can do that for different lengths of time. So we all have a different um, experience of pain. That's the bottom line on that. And if that's not enough, we also have pain genes that influence how we feel this pain. And just in 2016, this was reported out at Indiana University, the team discovered 36 pain genes. And they named them according to what the, the type of pain that you would feel based on that gene. So we go up back up to this other chart, shooting, throbbing, radiating, tingling, the way we feel pain in our body. They tried to name them according to how they made um, the pain, the person feel the pain. So again, everybody's experience of pain is different, but stress has a lot to do with, with it. So the other thing that's not so good about pain, it's bad enough we have to feel it. If we have chronic pain around for a while, it actually changes the structure of our brain. And the way it changes our, our brain structure, and there's been a number of studies that looked at different parts of the brain and did imaging and so forth of people with chronic pain. The, um, the area of the brain responsible for thinking, the prefrontal cortex, and our memory area of the brain, the hippocampus, which is next to the amygdala there, 
the prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus actually shrinks. Those neurons get smaller, and that's because the dendrites lose connection and they shrink. It's different with the emotional center of the brain. The emotional center of our brain actually expands. It gets more reactive. It gets more connections in those neurons. And so it's really impacting. It gives you a stronger reaction to pain that you feel. And also your learning circuitry, your, your, um, your learning circuitry is impacted because that's the memory center and your prefrontal cortex. The good news is this can be reversed because those neurons are still there. What you have to do is grow back some of those connections that actually shrunk. And the way to do that now is to calm your nervous system. Use different mindfulness techniques. Um, it's been proven over again, thousands of studies that show mindfulness training can actually calm your nervous system so that you reduce the emotional reaction to pain that you feel, move your attention away from pain, and release your body's natural painkillers so that if you do these practices, like I said, even for a few minutes every day, you can maintain a higher level of those body's natural painkillers in your system. And you restore the structural changes in your brain, your prefrontal cortex, your hippocampus can uh, grow back to their normal size and the amygdala can shrink back so you don't have that emotional reaction that you had before. So mindfulness techniques are the number one brain changer as a result of all the neuroscience uh, studies that have been going on. I just want to point out what some of these brain chemicals are that get released whenever you're doing these techniques I'm going to show you in a few minutes. These are sometimes called our happy chemicals or our feel-good brain chemicals. Dopamine is the brain chemical of motivation. It motivates us to do something because we want to do it. So for instance, if you're going to do something fun, like go watch a fun movie, you'll have the dopamine flowing. Even if you think you're going to go watch a movie that you like, the dopamine will start flowing. So it'll give you that motivation. And it holds your attention. It helps with attention. Oxytocin is considered uh, the bonding hormone People who have a lot of empathy have oxytocin in their system. When you think of somebody you love, the oxytocin will flow. It turns out it's also a very good analgesic. So it works like the endorphins by providing pain relief. Serotonin, most people know, is the calming uh, hormone. And it works as an antidepressant. And then, of course, the endorphins, pain relief. So these chemicals all together, the balance of them create your mood. And if you're feeling in a better mood, you're feeling less pain. And we can do this through some, we can release those chemicals and have higher level, levels of the chemicals in our body by some simple guided mindfulness tools. Now, some of us, if you think of meditation or yoga or something, you think you try it for time and then you get kind of bored with it. You're not motivated to do it all the time. Well, I have found some really simple ones with simple steps that I actually look forward to doing every day. I can't believe it. <laughs> I, um, I use these tools every single day and I'll show them to you. These are, um, first I'm going to show you an application that you would download on your cell phone or your tablet. And then I'll show you something you can do on your computer if you don't want to use a cell phone or a tablet. 
But the key word here is guided. These are guided mindful exercises. So um, UCLA has a mindfulness center and they have free guided mindfulness meditations that anybody can use. And it's, they're, very, they're very easy to download on your phone and start using them. So this is the little symbol that you'll see when you go to either your, your Google Play Store or your iPhone App Store is where people go. A lot of people now um, on their smartphones and on their tablets, they're playing different kinds of games, playing card games. Um, so these are pretty easy to do. Just go to your app store, download them. And this particular one, as soon as you open it, you get that first screen that I have is labeled number one. I took pictures of my cell phone. So the first thing you see when you open this app called UCLA Mindful is some choices. <clears throat> what type of meditation, guided meditations do you want? <laughs> Excuse me. I circle basic and there to show you that I selected basic. And then number two, that's the screen that comes up when you select basic. And so you can see them right there. There they are. There's a breathing meditation for five minutes. Um, there's a complete, there's, you can get the meditation instructions for 19 minutes. There's one there for seven minutes. I don't show all of them there, but there's a whole list that comes up and you can pick one. And once you tap on that, it will immediately start playing. I particularly like this because it's so easy uh, and you can choose the length of time you want. And the woman's voice who is guiding you, whether it's just guided breathing or a guided body scan, her voice is beautiful. It's so easy to listen to and so calming and relaxing. I use one of these every day after I have lunch is when I kind of I lay down in my bed and put my cell phone next to my ear and just close my eyes and listen. And I follow her instructions. And if my mind wanders, I pull my mind back. The idea behind this mindfulness idea is that you don't let your mind wander. You keep it focused totally on what the person is saying and what they are telling you to do. So if you use your computer instead of a tablet or a smartphone, this is the website that you can go to. I have the website listed below, and this is a screenshot. You can see what the exercises or what the guided meditations look like on the screen there. But in any case, if you don't um, remember what the website is. All you have to do is Google UCLA, UCLA Health Free Guided Meditations. Just put that in. If you use Google, I'm starting to use Bing more now, too, as a, as a search engine. So you can get hold of those and use your computer instead. Now, another one I really, this is my favorite. It has a few more steps, but it has many, many free applications in it. So again, you download it. It's called Insight Timer. And you download this from your app store. Once you download it and open it, now they tell you they have 60,000, 60,000 free guided meditations in here. Um, but they try to get you to buy stuff. So when the screen comes up, I put that ignore there because they're asking you if you want to do a seven day free trial. Well, I ignore that. And I go down to the bottom of my screen where you see a little magnifying glass that uh, will put you to the search field. So I go down to the very bottom of my screen and I click on that little hourglass there. 
And then it brings me up to a search field where I can type in something. And then I put ignore there, ignore all those other areas because the, those are ones that they wanna charge you for. When, as I said, they have a whole database of 60,000 free applications in here. So what I do is I type in any kind, it's like a Google search. You can type in there any kind of types of guided imagery or meditations that you happen to like. So for me, I one time I typed in um, guided imagery ocean waves and a whole bunch a list will come up let's see i don't know what i i guess i oh yeah i typed in ocean waves guided imagery this time and there you see as soon as you type that in a whole list comes up and then you can go through these now you do have to play each one to see which one you'll like because the voices um some of the voices i didn't care for it's hard to find that that voice that you resonate with and it makes you comfortable and makes you want to relax so this is a little bit of trial and error but uh, so what the one i picked here i just circled one it's seven minutes long it's called serene beach guided imagery and sounds so i click on that and then that's what your next screen will look like and it gives you a little a description of it. And then of course you click on the arrow up there and it'll start playing. And then it shuts off after seven minutes. So these are the most wonderful tools. If you can find something on in one of these that you really enjoy doing and do it every day, you're, you'll start to get calmer and you'll start to notice that you don't react emotionally as quickly. And you should start to notice um, the intensity of your pain going down. Now you can say, well, how long will that take? Well, it depends a little bit on how often you do this. And um, it's important how, how long every day, I should say. You need really want to do it every day how long every day. Um, I'll show you some examples of um, different studies that were done. But if you do, I'll just throw out a number there. If you do 15 minutes a day for four weeks, you should be noticing changes. You should be noticing that you feel calmer and that you're able to cope better with your pain and you don't feel the intensity of your pain. Now that's a a general statement. I'll show you some more numbers later. This one was a randomized controlled study, which is kind of the gold standard of studies of seniors who had chronic pain. And they took an eight week mindfulness course. MBN, MBSR stands for Mindfulness Based Stress Reduction. And it's an actual eight week program that many of the medical centers and hospitals are using now. But people who went through this training were told to practice uh, in 30 minute sessions, four days a week. So they didn't do it every day, but they did it 30 minutes at a time, four days a week. And after that eight weeks, they saw a significant change in their pain. It was reduced dramatically. They were able to cope with their pain better. They had improved attention and, um, and their memories got better. And so these were seniors that were, let's see, they were uh, older than 65. So everybody was older than 65. This particular one, again, it was after eight weeks and it was about lower back pain. This was reported out in 2015 in the Journal of Neuroscience. But this involved more people, about 300 people. And they did different types of mindfulness meditations. In this particular program, they did guided imagery. 
And some of them were guided imagery where they imagined they were on a beach. They imagined they were walking in nature. They had different programs that they followed. But again, 64% improvement less in the intensity and the pain they were feeling in their back. And the what they found is they did brain scans after this and they determined that this mindfulness was associated with a decreased activity in the thalamus of the brain. So you have a, I don't have that picture here, but if you call the thalamus, it sends signals to the front part of the brain, which was your attention, and also to the emotional center of your, of your brain. Well, those centers weren't getting activated. So there was less attention being paid to this as well. I wanted to show you this one because the military is doing a lot with guided breathing. So they listen to a recording of somebody telling them how to breathe. And they found that after 15 minutes a day, they do this 15 minutes a day, after four weeks of doing this, they had significant changes in their ability to focus and in their ability to control their emotional reactions when they were in chaotic situations. So if they were in combat or some chaotic situation, they were able to concentrate and stay focused. This is the free program. Um, it's, a, it's the eight week program that I had mentioned. If you're interested in it, you can start out with the, the tool that I showed you, um, UCLA Mindfulness. That's the quickest, easiest one. You can start as soon as we're done with this presentation. But if you want to, to do um, the eight week program, it's quite comprehensive. There's a lot of exercises. It's been very beneficial. It is online. And this is the website. It's called PalouseMindfulness.com. And so you can just go there and he will, there's a little introductory video there and he'll tell you how to go about participating in this program. So that's all I had for my presentation today, other than to wish you a happy Thanksgiving. And I hope you, I hope you get some benefits from this and I hope you do try some of these tools. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Jill. That was great. Um, I wanted to, it was wonderful to see the different app applications that people could download to try some of those mindfulness techniques. I had a couple of questions that came up. Um, one was when you are doing meditation and guided imagery, could you could you do this when you start to feel some pain? And would that help you to, to lessen that pain down the road? Or do you need to be doing this sort of on a more continual basis to sort of build that up? Well, um, that's kind of like in two parts. The first answer is yes. If you're feeling pain right now, uh, and I do this myself, I will, I, I grab my cell phone and I go lay down in my bed. I lay down, you can sit up also. I happen to lay down and I'll play one of those, even one of those short ones. And it creates this level of calmness and it just dials down that intensity right away. Now, the idea of doing it every day is that um, soon you just won't you you won't feel the uh, intensity the way you did in the past. Pretty soon it'll be dialed down and at a lower level all the time. That's wonderful. So you you can it sounds like you can build up sort of a tolerance for pain by doing these exercises or more of a tolerance perhaps. I know That's the exact word. You're building your tolerance for it. You're building up your tolerance. Great. And and I know um, I had a uh, we had a comment that came in and it just said, you know, 
that we that most of us right now, particularly in this time during the pandemic, we need anxiety relief, you know, and from all the social stress stressors that are out there. So she's been using meditation to help with that. And it's it's been it's been a, a big tool. Um, that I think so many of us can use, not just for pain, but for stress, anxiety, and, and everything else that is coming up these days. Um, I would love if we could, uh, if we're able to share your presentation afterwards so that they have the um, information regarding those um, different apps that somebody might be able to download. Um, if that if that ends up being okay with you, we'll go ahead and share that out uh, for anyone who watched the presentation today. I think it it might be helpful for for folks to just to have those um, the names of each of those apps available to them. Um, did you, Gail, was there anything else that you uh, that you wanted to share? I know um, I also love the technique of using sort of uh, the, the touch, the light touch uh, when you're when you're having some pain. I know that that's been helpful for me. Um, <laughs> you know, even, even getting your flu shot, right? They oftentimes, you know, uh, I know when I had my flu shot this year, they they used a technique where you're just sort of jiggling your arm where yes. you so, so right, right. <laughs> So, uh, you know, there are so many things out there that can be helpful and we want people to know that there are options out there to, you know, hopefully lessen your pain. Um, we do have a few presentations that are coming up that are related to pain that I did want to share with everyone. Our next talk is actually going to be on Thursday, November 12th, um, and it's regarding chronic pain and alternative treatments. And that will be with Dr. Robert Behrens from the TMC Integrative Pain Center. And then we also have uh, Dr. Abraham that will be speaking about using pain relievers from aspirin to opiates um, coming up on Tuesday, November 17th at 4 p.m. So we have some more presentations that are coming up and we really appreciate you being here today, Jill because I think this is just, these are great tools that anyone can use and you explain them in such great, in a great way that people can understand um, ways that they can, they can help and, and do things at home. So thank you so much for being here today. Um, and we love, we love your presentations, Jill. So we look forward <laughs> to having you back soon. Um, and thank you all for being here as well. Um, we'll be sharing this broadcast as well once we are all finished um, with, with everybody through TMC for Seniors. Thank you.